on World News Tonight. More repression. Myanmar's military government in its latest move of repression disbands former leader Aung San Suu Kyi's party. On the path to war. Why has Russia decided to stop sharing nuclear information with the United States? Does it have anything to do with the war in Ukraine? Find out tonight. Aboriginal victory. A bill that would trigger the referendum of Aboriginal right has passed in the Australian government. And it's a wiener palooza. 150 dogs and their owners dress up in a fancy costume as they parade along the streets of Florida. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News Tonight. Now there was a statement of concern from Australia, Japan, the United Kingdom and the United States over the Myanmar military's dissolution of the country's former ruling party, warning that the move could bring further instability to the violence-wracked country. Myanmar's military government has dissolved the ousted ruling party for former leader Aung San Suu Kyi and 39 other parties over their failure to register for an election set to prolong the army's grip on power. The US and several allies have condemned Myanmar's military for disbanding dozens of political parties. Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy was one of 40 parties to be dissolved on Tuesday over their failure to meet a deadline to register for an election. No date has been set for the polls, but they have already been widely condemned as a way for the junta to legitimize its seizure of power in a coup two years ago. Since 2021, a bloody crackdown on protests has given rise to an armed struggle against the junta, with more than one million people displaced by the fighting. The military says it's targeting terrorists and not civilians. Su Chi is currently serving a 33-year prison sentence on charges her allies say were trumped up to end her political career. Dozens of her colleagues are also in jail or have fled. U.S. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel. We strongly condemn the uh, Burma military regime's uh, decision to abolish 40 political parties, including, as you so noted, the National League for Democracy. Uh, any election without the participation of all stakeholders uh, in Burma uh, would not be and cannot be considered free or fair. And given the widespread opposition to military rule, the regime's unilateral push towards elections likely will escalate instability. A spokesperson for Myanmar's military could not immediately be reached for comment. Its leader on Monday urged international critics to get behind his efforts to restore democracy instead of siding with a resistance he calls terrorists. However, U.S. allies have echoed Washington's sentiment. Japan's foreign ministry has called for the immediate release of NLD officials, including Suu Kyi, while Britain and Australia expressed concern about a narrowing of the political space in the country. As Russia's military began drills with its Yaz intercontinental ballistic missile launchers in Siberia while fighting in Ukraine rages, tensions with the United States mounts. Russia says that it will end the sharing of information about its nuclear forces with the United States, including notifications on missile tests under the last remaining nuclear arms treaty with Washington after suspending its participation last month. First was Russia pulling back from the New START treaty. Now, Moscow has announced it will end the sharing of information on its nuclear forces with the United States. According to Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Ryabkov, Moscow has stopped information exchanges with Washington, including notices on planned test launches of its ballistic missiles. He stressed that any notification and all activity under the New START treaty will be suspended and will not be conducted regardless of what position the U.S. may take. The U.S. had already said Monday that it would halt the sharing of information on its nuclear forces following a decision by Russia to pull back from the New START nuclear pact last month. The latest from the Kremlin is all the more concerning as Russian President Vladimir Putin announced earlier this month that it will be moving tactical nuclear weapons into Belarus, raising fears that it may use such weapons against Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky on Wednesday invited Chinese President Xi Jinping to Ukraine for talks, marking what would be the first communication between the two leaders since the outbreak of the war. During an interview with the Associated Press, Zelensky said he is ready to talk to Xi 
and expressed his willingness for the meeting to take place. The comments come as Zelensky had recently shown his openness to Chinese-led peace talks using Beijing's 12-point peace plan as a backdrop. Xi had previously said that he plans to speak with Zelensky following his summit with Putin earlier this month. However, that has yet to happen, with seemingly no end to the war in Ukraine in sight. A bill that would trigger the referendum on whether to enshrine an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to the Australian Parliament has been introduced into the lower house. The bill already has the support needed for it to pass the House and later the Senate. Australia took the first formal steps towards a referendum to recognise Indigenous people in its constitution and set up a so-called voice to Parliament to advise lawmakers on matters that impact them. A bill introduced on Thursday triggers a nationwide vote later this year on the matter, as the country's Aboriginal people are not acknowledged in its 122-year-old constitution. Attorney General Mark Dreyfus said it would help Australians come together for a more reconciled future. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have occupied the Australian continent for over 60,000 years and represent the oldest continuous living cultures in human history. Yet Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are not recognised in our constitution. We will all stand with a clean heart and a clean conscience and we will know our country is on the path to a better direction. For much of Australia's history, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have been sidelined by colonial rulers. Although they make up about 3.2% of the country's population, they were not granted voting rights until the 1960s and consistently track below national averages on most socio-economic measures. Campaigns to say yes to the voice are underway. Its supporters include Thomas Mayo, a signatory to the earlier Uluru statement that called for the committee. Well, the symbolic part of the, the referendum is recognising Indigenous people as the first peoples. Uh, but the form of recognition that Indigenous people have proposed is through having a voice, because it gives us greater fairness. The main opposition Liberal Party says it hasn't reached a decision yet on supporting constitutional amendments. But its junior coalition partner, the rural-based National Party, says it would oppose them. A Guardian poll last week found 59% of respondents were in favour of the referendum. Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu won a historic vote at the United Nations that calls on the world's highest court to establish for the first time the obligations countries have to address the climate crisis and the consequences if they don't. Today, we have witnessed a win for climate justice of epic proportions. That was Vanuatu Prime Minister Ishmael Kalsakau on Wednesday after the United Nations General Assembly voted to ask the world's top court for an advisory opinion on national climate obligations. The legal opinion could drive countries to take stronger measures and clarify international law. Importantly, the court will tell us what the legal consequences are for states that disregard these laws and cause climate and environmental harm. Countries will submit input over the next year, and it could take the court around 18 months to issue an advisory opinion. The Republic of Vanuatu was the driving force behind the four-year campaign, leading a core group of 18 countries, ranging from Costa Rica to Germany. The United States did not support the resolution. A spokesperson for U.S. President Joe Biden's administration said, quote, diplomacy, not an international judicial process, is the most effective path forward. Vulnerable countries like Bangladesh are applauding the move. The country's foreign secretary said the resolution's passage was a defining moment that could help bridge the gap between promised climate financing and what is being delivered. We hope this resolution and the consequent advisory opinion will provide a better understanding of the legal implications of climate change under international law and the rights of present and future generations to be protected from climate change. The resulting advisory opinion could be a vital input to the burgeoning climate-driven lawsuits around the world. There are upwards of 2,000 cases pending worldwide. Other international courts and tribunals are also being asked to clarify and define the law around climate obligations. 
including the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. President Yoon suk yeol continued to pledge a greater global role for Seoul in promoting democratic values. He attended the hybrid regional session of the Summit for Democracy in Seoul after opening the leaders' plenary session virtually. South Korea will champion freedom, human rights and the rule of law as the host of the next and what will be the third summit for democracy. That's according to President Yoon suk yeol speaking at the second virtual summit event which he co-hosted with the leaders of the United States, Costa Rica, Zambia and the Netherlands. Kicking off the first leaders' plenary session on Wednesday, Yoon stressed the need to defend democracy amid a combination of geopolitical conflicts and competition, which has greatly reduced multilateral cooperation. Yoon also referred to revisionist attempts to change global norms, as well as misinformation that hurts democratic processes like decision-making. To counter such forces and pursue shared prosperity, Yoon said South Korea will advocate freedom in the international arena, having received the support of the global community some 70 years ago from the ashes of the 1950-53 Korean War. Furthering such efforts, Seoul will host the third summit for democracy, according to a joint statement by Presidents Yoon and Biden on Wednesday. The two leaders said that South Korea's democratic institutions are a beacon of strength in the Indo-Pacific and that the South Korean people have enduring commitment to government transparency, effective checks and balances and laws that are responsive to public needs. First launched in 2021 by President Biden, the Summit for Democracy aims to reinforce freedom, civil and political rights by strengthening democratic norms and institutions amid the rise of authoritarianism. Beijing and Moscow's foreign ministries have criticized the latest virtual event, accusing Washington of fueling ideological divisions by framing them as autocratic powers. We're going into a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, there has been some unfortunate news from the Vatican as Pope Francis had had a respiratory infection and will need to spend a few days in hospital in Rome. The 86-year-old had breathing difficulties in recent days but does not have COVID. Pope Francis has a respiratory infection and will need to spend a few days in the hospital for treatment. That's according to a statement from the Vatican on Wednesday, which said the 86-year-old pontiff was taken to a Rome hospital after complaining of breathing difficulties over the past few days, but had tested negative for COVID-19. Francis is sometimes short of breath and generally more exposed to respiratory problems, having had part of his lung removed in his early 20s. His latest hospitalization comes ahead of a Palm Sunday service on April 2nd that marks the start of a hectic week of ceremonies leading to Easter Sunday on April 9th, throwing into doubt whether he would be able to lead them. Francis' health has attracted increased scrutiny over the past two years, during which he has undergone colon surgery and begun using a wheelchair or a walking stick due to chronic pain in one knee. The Vatican had initially said the Pope had gone to the hospital on Wednesday for a scheduled checkup, but Italian media reported that he arrived in an ambulance after cancelling a television interview at the last minute. Francis had appeared to be in good health Wednesday morning at his weekly general audience in St. Peter's Square. French authorities raided five banks as part of an investigation into suspected cases of massive tax fraud and money laundering, prosecutors said. Some 150 investigators conducted searches in Paris and the financial district La Defense. A sticky situation for French banks as some 150 investigators searched offices across the Paris area Tuesday, targeting Société Générale, BNP Paribas, its Exxon unit, HSBC and Natixis. The raids were the climax of an investigation into alleged tax fraud and money laundering using a strategy known by its Latin nickname, Cum Cum. That's when foreign investors in French companies temporarily transfer ownership of their shares to French banks in order to avoid higher taxes on dividend payouts. The practice is similar to Cum-X, in which investors used short-selling tactics to claim multiple dividend tax rebates when only a single rebate should have been due. 
a seminal investigative report published in 2018 by a group of European media outlets estimated cum-ex fraud has drained some 140 billion euros from European treasuries, particularly in Germany. Tuesday's raids are the latest stroke of bad luck for the global banking sector, already battered by a crisis of confidence that has seen spasms of selling in U.S. regional lenders and finished off Swiss giant Credit Suisse. Tuesday's raids could mean a load of trouble for the banks in question. Prosecutors are seeking fines of more than 1 billion euros. Now, more than 1,000 technology leaders and researchers, including Elon Musk, have urged artificial intelligence labs to pause development of the most advanced systems, warning in an open letter that AI tools present profound risks to society and humanity. Elon Musk has joined artificial intelligence experts and industry executives worried about AI's impact on society. He is among signatories to an open letter calling for a six-month pause in developing systems stronger than OpenAI's GPT-4. The letter was issued by the non-profit Future of Life Institute and signed by more than 1,000 people. They've called for a pause in advanced AI development until shared safety rules for it are developed, implemented and audited by independent experts. The letter said powerful AI systems should be developed only once the effects are likely positive and the risk manageable. It listed potential threats from competitive AI systems in the form of economic and political disruptions. Tesla CEO Musk was one of the signatories, along with Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak and researchers at Alphabet-owned DeepMind and other AI heavyweights. The Future of Life Institute is mainly funded by the Musk Foundation, according to the EU's transparency registers. Though Tesla uses artificial intelligence for an autopilot system, Musk has been vocal about his concerns over AI. On Monday, EU police force Europol warned about the potential misuse of the system in cybercrime and disinformation. The UK government also unveiled proposals for an adaptable regulatory framework around AI. Since Microsoft-backed OpenAI launched ChatGPT last year, rivals have moved quickly to develop similar models. OpenAI didn't immediately respond to request for comment about the letter. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved selling naloxone without a prescription, setting the overdose-reversing drug on course to become the first opioid treatment drug to be sold over the counter in the United States. It is the move some advocates have long sought as a way to improve access to the life-saving drug, though the exact impact will not be clear immediately. The fight against opioid overdoses in the United States got a big regulatory boost. The Food and Drug Administration on Wednesday approved over-the-counter sales of emergent biosolutions Narcan without a prescription. That will make the life-saving medication used to reverse opioid overdoses more widely available. The company said the nasal spray would appear on U.S. shelves and at online retailers by late summer. Narcan or naloxone rapidly reverses or blocks the effects of opioids, restoring normal respiration especially when given within minutes of the first sign of an overdose. Drug-related overdose deaths in the United States rose about 15 percent year over year to more than 100,000 in 2021, according to official data. While the approval puts emergent ahead in the OTC product race, analysts say the company isn't likely to see a significant sales boost from the change. One pointed out that sales for Narcan peaked in 2020 and have declined since. Shares of Emergent were up 3% in morning trading, though they have lost about 80% of their value over the past year. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. An unusual thunder snow was responsible for the late spring snow that fell on Ontario. Thunder snow is when thunder and snow fall at the same time. It is the second time this winter this relatively rare event occurs in Ontario. The governor of Kentucky said that fatalities were expected after two U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopters crashed during the routine training mission over the state. The status of the crew members was not immediately known without providing the number of people who were on board. King Charles has spoken of the warmth of the friendship between United Kingdom and Germany, saying in his first state visit abroad since ascending the throne last year that it was a friendship which mattered greatly to his mother, late Queen Elizabeth II. 
Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said that he hoped what he called frictions between Azerbaijan and Iran would soon be resolved. Relations between Azerbaijan and Iran, which was a large population of ethnic Azeris in its northwest, have been strained in recent months after Baku announced plans to open formal diplomatic ties with Israel. Indonesia has been stripped of the right to host the Under-20 Football World Cup. FIFA has said in a statement after protests against Israel's participation led to the cancellation of the tournament's main draw. And that is all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with around 150 dogs and their owners dressing up for the Wiener Palooza Dash and Parade. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.